Um, you know, because everyone has a funny story about Arturo. Cause they, everyone, from what I learned about Arturo, he, he was a comedian type of guy. Um, tell me your favorite funny story of Arturo. <laughs> There's so many of them, I don't know where to start. I mean, um, I was just telling one of the other fellows that asked me for an interview, Vincent Moore, um, a real funny story. We were in a nightclub in New York called The Crowbar. And uh, we went outside, and we were getting our car, and Arturo says, give me a couple of minutes. I thought he went to go talk to a chick. So I'm standing and I'm talking to the doorman in the bounce and we're laughing and we're bullshitting. And then after about 10 minutes, I mean, my car came up and I'm looking for Arturo. And you hear two guys coming up the block. And uh, one guy said, bro, you know who that was? He goes, no. He goes, that was Arturo Gatti buying all the homeless people hot dogs. He was down the block at a hot dog wagon eating hot dogs from a wagon, 3 o'clock in the morning. And there was about 15, 20 people that were laying around like they, they were panhandled by the clubs. Arturo said, ah, I won't give you money, but I'll feed everybody, come on. And they all lined up, and he was buying them two, three, four, five hot dogs each. And it was just, you know, I'm looking from thinking he's scoring a girl. In the meantime, he's feeding the homeless people down the block. Now, now was, did he pay the extra 25 cents for the sauerkraut, or? Do, hey, do, don't suggest my friend was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> he would have bought them steaks if he was at a steakhouse. Yeah, they don't have many steak stands there. But um, now, tell me about, like, um... Um, like some of the things, like, uh, were you around him in the gym when, uh... He used uh, to pull everybody's shorts down? Yes, I was asked about that, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that. He did that to quite a few people. Oh, they were hitting the speed bag, they'd be standing hitting the speed bag, getting all into it, not to come over, and the guy'd be wearing a jack strap, and he'd yank his shorts down, and they'd chase him around the gym. I mean, that's just some of the funny stuff. Oh, my God. Oh, one time we were out eating, uh, uh, Chinese food after the Mickey Ward second fight he won. We went out to eat Chinese food and they gave me a uh, bowl of soup. It was so freaking hot, I couldn't even touch the bowl. And I, you know, the soup was boiling hot. Arthur goes, you're gonna eat that? It's bro, it's so hot, I can't even touch it. He goes, yeah, yeah, let me see. He, he took a little s scoop of it with the spoon. And then the rest of the food came and I'm talking to the waiter. I turned around and I don't know how he did it, but he ate the entire bowl of soup. He goes, you weren't gonna eat that, why? I looked at the bowl, it was empty. I started laughing. He goes, man, it was good. <laughs> I brought, wanted the soup. You think I ordered for him? I'm not going to eat it. You know, uh, I know you know, uh, um, I, you seem like a pretty smooth guy. Um, great Arturo Gatti, um, how he was, like, uh, smoothness with the ladies. I mean, was he able to, like... Was, he was just so, listen, he was lovable to anybody. I mean, when the girls got to meet him and talk to him, he had that accent. He had the biggest, brightest smile. He had that little kid look in his eye. He had a, you know, he just had a good aura around him, no matter who met him. Whether it was a young lady or an old lady, an old man, a young man, a kid, he just had this genuine aura of, of quality, of pureness, uh, of being fun, uh, being, you know, just Arthur. Arturo just was just, uh, when he walked into a dark room, it lit up, bro. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about uh, Arturo Gatti, um, the, f the family man, because, um, you know, he had two children. Um, I, I mean, can you tell me what your observations were of him? A very loving father, very caring father. Uh, he thought way ahead. He thought of their college funds. He thought of their futures. He wanted to play with them. He was looking so much forward to growing old with them. He had plans for them. Uh, he wanted to make sure that they became uh, professionals in the world. Uh, he made sure that he ate with them. He, you know, he, he, his mother and his father. He had a nice family background at home. It was very tight knit Italian family in French Canada. Uh, they spoke French, they wrote French, they spoke Italian, they wrote Italian, they spoke English, uh, and, and a few other languages. I believe Arthur spoke about four languages. And his family bond was extremely tight. The father passed away when he was a young boy. So the morals and traditions and the respect that his mother instilled into them, he carried it everywhere and went. And, you know, they're classy people, they're hard-working people, blue-collar people, and Arturo happened to become a breadwinner, and he couldn't wait to go home and share his wealth with his family because that was the way he was raised, tight-knit with everybody, help everybody, never turned his back, especially his mother and his brother and his, his sister and his nieces. I mean, he adored them. And he, that transfer, you know, it, it was obvious when you saw him with his children that he brought those morals and those traditions along with him. Mm -hmm. Just uh, a great guy. But talk to me about, you know, does it hurt you sometimes? Does, is it hard for you to, to detach yourself emotionally from uh, the detractors or the doubters who say that he did it? No, it, it, you know, honestly, listen, they're ill-informed. But you know what, either way, even if they did, they did talk positive about it, to detach myself emotionally is almost virtually impossible. I'm so caught up in it, this kid's like part of my skin, he's like part of my DNA. 
in life. He was my friend. I loved him. He loved me. We we're good friends. Mm -hmm. I loved him like a little brother, you know. He looked up to me, respected me. I looked up to him. I respected him for his abilities. He respected me for mine. Um, but we were always honest and true with each other. There was no, no, no doubts and no games, no bullshit. It was straight always all the time on the table. Uh, the people are going to say what they're going to say no matter what. I mean, if it was written in stone, they're gonna, everybody has an opinion. Opinions are like assholes. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and sometimes they stink. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, sometimes. Not always, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, it depends on who you, if you just <laughs> showered, I guess, which board you're with. We're talking about opinions. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, you know, again, uh, people are going to say what they will. A lot of people thought that this investigation and all those people that were on that panel were paid for. They were not. The people that were paid were the two investigators that traveled to three separate countries to find out the truth and they came back with it, they assembled a team of people who were professionals to ask questions of them, what they thought of their opinion from the findings. Some of them, as you can see, went way above and beyond what we expected. Mm -hmm. And they've shown us how he was, his demise came and, and his last moments, and it was impossible for him to have been hanging from that area, and if he wasn't hung, then he was strangled. Mm -hmm. And if it, it, it had to be some kind of side. If it wasn't suicide, it was homicide. You know, there was, um, of course, some backlash. Uh, you know, you did the ESPN interview. Um, some people were saying that, you know, you threatened uh, the woman. Did you feel that that was a fair thing that they said about you? I, well, you know, what they say about me, I particularly don't care. If you feel that, the, if I said the wheels of justice are going to turn slow, if you feel threatened like that, then you must be guilty of something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in reality, what I say doesn't matter. The truth is what is, comes from professional people and experts in the field is what matters. And if you thought that that was threatening, then they must think that this must be the most serious threat of their life. Because the facts and the truth, if you did something wrong and somebody's unearthing the facts and the truth and digging up your cemetery, if you will, and expose your skeletons, yeah, you got a problem if you did something wrong. If you didn't, then you would embrace it and welcome it because you have nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. And then you delight and say that you were never a stripper. In the meantime, we have 10 people who worked with you that are alive today that you didn't fucking choke and strangle to death that could admit and show a picture of you on the sta stage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, look, what, what they say about me and what they think about me, they could go fuck themselves. I don't care. Mm -hmm. The truth will always prevail. Let me actually.